Okay, so okay. hello everyone. I can yeah, I'll, I'll just start real quick. Uh, introduce uh, Scott Pierce from uh, NSF NCAR. He is a uh, software engineer in the Computational and Information Systems Lab, and he does quite a bit of work with uh, Vapor, which is an excellent software tool to visualize um, many things. Uh, in this case, we'll be talking about Vapor applied to uh, Warp Fire, of course, since that's the tutorial. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Scott for a live demonstration. Right on. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, again, my name is Scott Pierce. I'm a software engineer up at Sizzle. And I'm on a small team that develops this graphics application called Vapor that you can see uh, that, that we use to create the visualization um, in the background here of the East Troublesome Wildfire in 2020. Um, Vapor is a 3D visualization tool that's cross-platform. So we distribute installers for Mac OS, Linux, all flavors of Linux, whether you're on Ubuntu, SUSE, Fedora, we support all Linux systems through uh, an app image installer, as they're called. And we also support uh, the Windows operating system. Our website is www.vapor.ucar.edu. And you can find our contact information as well as our GitHub page at the bottom right corner. Uh, you can contact me personally at pierce at ucar.edu or my entire team at vapor at ucar.edu. And we also have a link to our GitHub page if you uh, ever want to browse the code or modify it or do whatever you like, since it is all open source. It's open to the public and it's uh, totally free to use, analyze, and modify. So with that, uh, in this tutorial, I'll first talk about, I want to talk about, you know, what a vapor is and, and why you might want to consider using it. Um, because there's a lot of 3D graphics applications out there, uh, like Blender, Visit, and Paraview. And so that raises the question, what room is there for yet another 3D uh, visualization application? And the use case that we fill and the reason that we do what we do is because we really tailor ourselves towards geophysical visualization. 3D viz is hard no matter how you cut it because you're, you're analyzing an order of magnitude more data on the Z axis. You're not taking a simple slice, a two dimensional slice and animating that. You have to apply extra filters to the data in order to see through the 3D volume. And that makes things very, very challenging. By uh, specializing Vapor for uh, geophysical visualization, we can specify the application to the use cases of our users and streamline the data ingestion uh, for 3D viz. Um, so we don't support things like finite element simulations for rocket ships and that kind of thing. We specify in geophysical visualizations of ocean data, weather data, some space data, and that kind of thing. And that allows us to make it very easy for data ingest, which is one of the hardest parts of all visualization, getting your data massaged in a way that an application can read it. Uh, in this tutorial, I'm gonna be talking about two components of Vapor. First, there's the GUI, the graphical user interface that you will load data into and then be able to move around and navigate through your data in a similar way to Google Earth while applying parameters that will set color and opacity values to specific variables of your choosing um, throughout an interactive graphical user interface. So we'll go through that first, and that's usually the first stepping stone, interacting with your data. And then uh, after that, We'll be talking about Vapor's Python interface, the Python API, as we call it. And what this allows you to do is manipulate all those parameters I mentioned earlier that are in Vapor through a script. So if you're running a simulation, you can actively render uh, in 3D the data. Not on... Oh, sorry. Do we have a question? And feel free to like go on. Is there anything? If there are. If, if, you, if you don't have any questions or if you're not trying to talk, please just make sure you're muted. Thank you. Okay, yeah, just let me know if there are any questions and I can, uh, you know, I can stop because it is a lot to take in. Um, but like I was saying, the Python API allows you to uh, render visualizations uh, in the same way that you would through the graphical user interface, but through a script. And you can, I think one of the most powerful things about this is it allows you to make visualizations 
um, that modify the parameters in a way that you can't do like with a mouse. Um, you can do like scans. If you have a slice, you can scan it through your domain, like a CT scan. You can do things like rotate the camera around the scene. And we'll touch on that after we go through the GUI. Um, but being able to programmatically change these parameters opens up a new world uh, in terms of what kind of visualizations you can produce. Two of the big uh, key concepts we'll be talking about are, first of all, the uh, renderers. So Vapor uh, is comprised of 11 algorithms that we call renderers, and each renderer uh, depicts your data, uh, parameters of color and opacity and various other things. Uh, the workflow of Vapor is to first load your data, second, you instantiate one or more renderers, and then third, you capture images through a time series. And uh, the renderers are the most fundamental component, component of Vapor, and that's what we'll be going through. Uh, we'll be creating a series of renderers like the ones we see behind us. We see the smoke as a volume renderer. We see the fire area as a 2D data uh, renderer. We see a base map. And we also see a barb renderer. So we'll go through those four and then um, probably jump over to the Python API. And then when we do go to the Python API, we'll be doing some tricks to manipulate the camera to get some more cinematic uh, effects of what you can do as you animate your data through time. We'll be doing uh, one uh, trick called keyframing, where you pick two perspectives and interpolate between those to give a cinematic effect. And then we'll do an orbit around a central origin to uh, give a 360 degree view of a uh, specific point of interest. Uh, like right here, I guess I have the example of our orbit uh, happening, I think on Hurricane Hill, maybe. I'm not quite sure, but that kind of demonstrates the point. The last thing I'll say is that our team is looking for feedback in, in order to improve our UX experience. And so if you guys have any interest on, after you try Vapor, um, giving us feedback on what you'd like to see different or what you think we're doing right. Um, if you can take a screenshot uh, on your phone of this QR code, um, we would really appreciate the feedback. So um, while that's up, I think the first thing I'll do, I'm going to leave this QR code up just for a minute so you guys can take a picture of it if you want. But then I'll quickly go to our website just to show you guys what that looks like, if I can organize myself properly. So there's the QR code, and then paper.ucar.edu will take you to a landing page. And from there, you can go to our documentation, which uh, takes you to our downloads page where you pick your operating system platform, and you can download it from there. Um, you can find things like video tutorials, um, which I think are the best way to learn Vapor um, and written documentation as well. Um, and I think that kind of gets the point across. Once you, once you download your installer, um, like on Apple, for example, you'll have a DMG. You'll drag that to your applications directory. And then I'll go ahead and quit, quit my previous instance. But I have my Vapor icon down here. And like any other application, you'll just click on it and open it up. Um, from there, the first thing you do, like I mentioned earlier, is to load data into the application. To do that, we have this file menu up here. I'll select that, and I'll be importing WORF data. We support uh, five, six uh, general types of data. We support WORF ARW, which WORF Fire thankfully conforms to. We support CF compliant net CDF data. And so it's a kind of, NetCDF can be used to describe pretty much anything in the world. The CF conventions constrain the description of the grids that the NetCDF uh, data exists on. And so if your data is NetCDF CF compliant, we can read that. And if it's not CF compliant on our documentation site, we have instructions on how to make it conform. We support unstructured in-pass data. Uh, we support raw data, which we call brick of values. If you have a simple brick of floating point values in a file, you can write a text file that describes the dimensionality on X, Y, and Z, the extent size, and a few other parameters, like what the data type is, floating point, integer, etc. If you have a descriptive metadata file, we can read raw data. Another renderer that, uh, or data set that I will be demonstrating is... Um, called DCP or data collection particles. 
If you have particle data, which I think some of you may have that describe embers, we can render those embers alongside your uh, Eulerian or fire simulation. And so I will be uh, demonstrating that a little bit later. And then finally, we uh, support the unstructured grid, U-grid uh, data type. But for our purposes, we'll be doing worth ARW. So I'll click on that. And now we'll see a file di dialog that we will navigate to our data. And I think I put mine here. So the data that we are working with this week in the tutorial comes in two domains, two nested domains. I'm going to start with DO1, the big one, so we can get an outer uh, concept of the area we're working with. So I'll select all my DO1 files and open those. And immediately we see this uh, this, this cuboid described in this black area. This black area is what we call a visualizer. It's where the graphics process kind of exits the application. To move around, um, I'll use my mouse, and I highly recommend using Vapor with a mouse. Uh, the left mouse button will rotate. The right mouse button will zoom out and in. And the middle uh, mouse button will transpose the seam. On the left side, we have two basic areas. Up here on the top left is what we call our renderer table. This shows us our data sets and the renderers that we've instantiated. We haven't instantiated anything yet. We have the data set listed that we've loaded. I can click on that and see some uh, basic metadata, you know, where the data lives, the type, the file name, and some basic transforms that we can apply to it. If we wanna, if our Z axis is small, we can scale it by a factor of two if we like and just apply transforms to the entire data set. These transforms will apply to every renderer that we instantiate as well. So like I said earlier, it's all about the renderers. So the first thing I'm going to do is click on this green plus button and instantiate my first renderer. And I'm going to start with our barb renderer and show wind barbs. So I'll click on the barb renderer, make sure my data source points to my data set. And right now we only have one data set, so that's the default. I'll click OK. And here we have our barb renderer instance highlighted. Now down here are all the parameters that apply to my currently selected renderer. If I click on my data set, we get that metadata again. If I click on the barb renderer, these are all the metadata that are applied to my rendering. My renderer is currently turned off though by default. If we turned it on by default, sometimes the renderers are very computationally expensive. They'll put your computer at a halt. So by default, they always get instantiated as off. But to turn it on, you click on this little eyeball, and here we have our wind barbs, according to the default variables specified below the renderer table down here. We organize our parameters into three primary categories, the variables, the appearance, and the geometry. These pertain to uh, what we are rendering, the uh, variables being what variables we are rendering. The appearance is how we are rendering those variables and geometry is where we are rendering. So it's what, how, and where. On the variables tab, we can see our uh, basic uh, default parameters, our variable dimension. We can do 3D barbs or 2D barbs, uh, 3D applying to the 3D variables in the data set and 2D to the 2D ones. Vapor will try to pick U and V as the defaults. And I think for wind barbs, surface winds are probably the most interesting thing when it comes to uh, wildfires. So I'm going to click on the 2D dimensionality, and Vapor is going to default to U10 and V10. We can also uh, pick a Z field if we want. For 2D barbs, it usually doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you do have a W10 variable in your data set, you can get a little bit of lift onto your barbs by picking a variable here. And additionally, you can apply a height variable. So if you are in mountainous terrain, like um, what we saw in the PowerPoint presentation, you can see these little blue wind barbs back here being offset by the height variable that comes out of WORF. But in this data set, we're out in the plains, and so I'm going to skip the height variable because it's going to have no effect. Lastly, we have a color map variable, and we usually default to T for temperature. Um, I'm going to go ahead and animate this forward in time. You can see this little VCR controller up here. If you press play, you can see our barbs you know, wiggling around. And um, they're all being colored ac according to T2, our color map variable. One of the um, 
powerful features in Vapor is the ability to derive new variables. So often our users will wanna see these wind barbs colored by wind speed. So in order to do that, we can uh, write a Python script that defines a new variable and then apply it to a renderer. That can be found under the tools uh, submenu. You can click on Python variables and you get this dialog that first wants you to define your script name. So I'll click on new, call it speed, and I'll uh, say that it pertains to our currently and only loaded data set. And then we have to select our input variables. So for surface wind speed, I'll scroll down to V10 and U10. And then the output variable, I'll call it speed again. And then the output grid is on west, east by south, north. Um, the Vapor Python engine, as we call it, comes with some helper functions. It's called uh, a module called Vapor Utils. So the first thing I'll do is load that. So from Vapor Utils, import everything, and then simply say that speed equals mag, which is just magnitude of U10 and V10. Give it a test. Seems like it worked. Save it. Close. And now we should have a speed variable at the very bottom to color our wind barbs by. So now our wind barbs are being lengthened and colored by the speed variable. In the appearance tab, again, this is how we are rendering things, we have this thing called a transfer function. It's kind of like the beating heart of vapor. This is the primary way that you apply color and opacity to your renderer. What we see in the transfer function is just a probability dis distribution variable that's being colored at the current time step. So this is just a PDF of speed and we're coloring speed according to the color bar that we have down here. We can adjust this color bar by clicking on these color control points and I can drag this saturated blue value. And if I drag it all the way over, you can see my wind barbs are getting more and more blue. And only the ones over here at the right tail of the histogram are being colored red. If I click on this color control point, I can see it's data value around 14 meters per second. So we can see that roughly at this point, our wind barb is at 14 meters per second. Everything else is less than that. I can also do the same thing with my other control point and do the opposite. And I can also add new control points by double clicking on the color bar. So if I wanna drag this midpoint left and right, I can do that like so. Another thing about the histogram is that you have these bounds on the left and right. So if you're really interested on a certain region, like let's say I wanna look more closely at this peak over here on the left, I can drag the right bound over and the left bound over. And now we're looking at a color gradient that applies more specifically to the bounds around this single peak. A uh, few other things about the histogram are if you click on this gear icon, there's a bunch of options. Most of which you don't usually have to worry about things like color interpolation. Uh, I wouldn't bother getting into that, especially during this tutorial. But the big ones are saving and loading the color map. You might be dealing with one simulation and you want to save a color map that you have applied to fire area or smoke and apply that same thing to um, a, a later simulation like what we'll be doing later. You can also load built-in color maps. And the big ones that we typically, uh, I typically use personally with Vapor are, are the diverging color maps, which are two colors that meet in the middle with uh, white. So if I click on that, you can see we just have, it's uh, diverging between two colors meeting in the middle. And it's actually easier to see if we have more barbs. So I'm going to go down a little bit. Under this next section, we have uh, the, the barb count on X, Y, and Z. Of course, on Z, we only want one because this is two-dimensional. If I crank these all the way up, you can kind of see the wind field a little bit better. I'm going to reduce the length scale because they're overlapping each other. So if I drag this over, I've now reduced their length. Now, if I animate forward in time, we can kind of get a better idea of what the wind field is doing. And if I scroll back up, I can select a different color map if I like. Um, since wind is typically, it's not usually like a modal or bimodal distribution, um, I usually use a what is called a sequential color map for wind speed. 
And these are not the diverging color maps. These are just a sequence of colors transitioning from one to the next. And usually for wind speed, I pick the ice variable. Um, I think it's a good contrast between fire data, fire being you know, red and hot, and the wind speed being uh, blue gives it a good contrast. And so by clicking on the ice color map, that gets loaded. And we can see how that goes into effect. Um, so I think that's the basics of the bar renderer. I'll touch on the geometry renderer or the geometry tab real quick. Again, this is where we are rendering in space. But you can see my, since my renderings are very, they're very snappy, they're pretty fast. The status set isn't big enough to bring my computer to a halt, but sometimes the data sets are so big that you wanna restrict the region of data that you're loading onto your graphics card for performance reasons. And so the geometry tab creates this red box around your data set where you can constrain the region that is being rendered to. So I can grab this yellow handlebar, drag that over, and now I'm only rendering half of my data set. You can see over here, my uh, x-axis slider just got reduced by about half in accordance with what I did with my uh, red handlebar. So that's the geometry tab. I think uh, that's good for the barb. I'm gonna move on to our next renderer, which is gonna give us a spatial context of where we are um, in, in our simulation it, with a map pretty much. So I'll click on my uh, plus button again, select image and click okay. And our image renderer is our map, uh, our map uh, renderer pretty much. And Vapor comes with a few uh, preloaded maps here. I'll turn my bar renderer off with the eyeball icon so we can see a better picture of our map. And it's pretty bland. And the reason for that is we can't bundle high resolution maps with our installers. Otherwise the application would just be too big. We can't cover the entire planet with a 30 meter resolution map and stuff that into our installers. It, it, would, it wouldn't be practical. And so what we do is we ask our users to <clears throat> provide their own GeoTIFF imagery, a GeoTIFF being a geo-referenced image. And my favorite tool to do this, and I've put this in the reference material over here. If you guys haven't seen this yet, um, under the vapor section, I have an example visualization of what we can do. But underneath that, we have the NASA Worldview Map Creator. And if I click on that, it'll give us you know, some kind of Google Earth looking uh, map that gives us all sorts of satellite products that we can select and uh, choose from to create geotiffs. The link that I've just provided is already kind of centered around Springfield, Colorado, this area where the fire happened. But if you're looking for somebody somewhere else, you can, uh, let's see, just search for Boulder, Colorado. And it'll take you there. But you can see that the satellite swath wasn't covering Boulder at this exact time step, September 17th, 2020. Um, you can adjust it with this slider over here. So maybe if I adjust it over here, oh, there's a swath that's close to Boulder, but it's kind of like a hunt and peck exercise uh, for the area that you're looking for. So I'm going to go back to September 20, uh, 20th or September 17th, 2020, and then go back to Springfield. And then I'm going to X out of that. And to the top right, you can see this uh, icon that says, take a snapshot. I'm gonna click on that. And it's gonna let me choose the bounds of my snapshot. So I think this fire was a ways south, if I remember, whoops. I'm actually gonna scroll a little bit down to the south in the hopes that I can, and zoom out a little bit, in the hopes that I can select an area that encompasses um, the region that we've simulated. So again, click on the snapshot. I'm gonna go for the highest resolution available, 30 meters with my current satellite product. Select GeoTIFF. And I guess select my extents. So there's Springfield. I'm just gonna go, we'll see how long this takes to download actually. See if I'm getting in trouble. Uh, download. That was pretty quick. So hopefully I got the right area. I'll go back to Vapor now. And so now I'm in my image renderer. Um, 
I'll go to my appearance tab, which is how we are rendering things and select the image file that we just downloaded. By default, we are doing this natural earth tile map image that comes bundled with vapor, but I'm gonna to go to my downloads directory and click the snapshot I just created. Oh, it wasn't big enough. Okay, let's go back and do that again. Um, zoom out. And since that was so fast, I guess I can be liberal with the area. I mean, just take the whole thing. I think that should cover it. Even though we have a blackened area where the swath didn't capture imagery, Am I exceeding the download size though? There, let's see if that does it. Well, that's going, I'll come back to it later. Um, you can see our geo-referenced image being uh, depicted at the bottom. Um, after we selected it in our appearance tab. I'll just really click, quickly touch on the variables tab here. The only variable you have to concern yourself with is the height variable. If you're in mountainous terrain, again, you can select HGT, but since this is the flatlands, uh, we won't bother with it. So now we have barbs rendered on top of our image and we'll come back and select that larger image uh, once it's done downloading. The next thing I'll do, since this is the larger domain, we don't have a fire area variable, and I don't think we have a smoke variable either. Let's, let me double check. I'll instantiate a volume renderer, which is a 3D data renderer. And I will select, oh, there is a smoke variable in the large area. So let's go ahead and let's try it. I will select fire smoke and go ahead and turn the renderer on. And here we see our big red brick. So what's happening here is we are maybe, let me pick, let's see, maybe temperature is a little sensical for our first volume renderer. This big brick is um, being output from our volume renderer, which is known as, uh, what in, in graphics parlance, known as a ray caster. Every single pixel on this visualizer, this, this screen that we're rendering is having a ray cast perpendicular to the screen at every pixel. And that pixel travels through the volume sampling data until it reaches either a maximum opacity value or it exits the domain. Once it achieves one of those two uh, factors, it returns a color value that gets painted onto our screen. So right now we are looking at all of our data in the cube at full opacity. We can't see through anything. And this is one of the things that I was mentioning earlier that makes 3D visualization hard you have to filter the data. And again, we do that through our transfer function. So for that, I'll go to my appearance tab. Again, how we're rendering. And this is our temperature probability distribution function. All the colors again are being applied according to the position on the X axis. But this time with the volume renderer, we have these control points up here, this black bar. These are the opacity control points. I can click on them and drag them down. And the further down they are on the, on the uh, y-axis, the more transparent they become. You can see some of my barbs are starting to come through in the bottom as I'm applying a, a, a transparency to more and more of the data values. So by dragging these color control points down, I can mask the data. By pulling everything down, everything disappears. By pulling everything up, everything is completely opaque. And so the trick is finding a transfer function that shows your observables that you're trying to go after. So if I go back to my variables tab and I go back to fire smoke, we can see, of course, it's a big red brick um, because most of the fire values are at zero. In fact, let's see if I mess with these. I would expect us to see some fire values, but maybe not. In this domain, maybe there is a fire uh, smoke variable, but it's not being resolved at uh, enough resolution. Um, if I, yeah, the, I, the histogram is empty. So there are no smoke values um, that I can ascertain in this data set. So let's load the data for our, um, our, our nested domain too. I'll turn off my smoke variable. I'll turn off the barbs for now. And I will go to my file menu, back down to import like we did before and select WRF ARW. 
This time we'll select DO2. So these are all the files from the nested domain. Open those as a new data set, separate from the last one. And now we have DO2 with its metadata and transform properties. I think I stretched DO1. If I click on this, yeah, I gave it a stretch factor of two. So let's go ahead and let that match between the two data sets. So they're both being stretched by a factor of two on the Z axis and go ahead and create our first renderer for it. So I'll click on the plus icon. And this time we need to specify that we are targeting domain O2 with a new volume renderer. So I'll go to the data source dropdown, work out DO2, then click volume, then click OK. And if I turn it on, I should see our nested domains brick. Pretty red, but you can see there is some color variation. So we do have some smoke values in there. If I go to my transfer function, it looks like the extents need to be modified a little bit. And I'm not even looking at smoke, I don't think. If I go back to my variables tab, you can see, yeah, I'm looking at cloud fraction. You can see the variable name that pertains to the renderer um, in the table. So if I go back to my variables tab and click fire smoke, you can see, okay, there's some variation down there at the bottom. So let's mask out some of those red values so we can see the smoke that uh, resides within, within the uh, volume. Um, you can see most of our values are zero values, but there are some other values that don't even register as a pixel on the histogram. I'm going to click on the opacity controller and bring it all the way down. And you can see smoke right down here if I navigate into it. And if we, let's see, I'm at time step 24. Um, that's what this indicates up here by the VCR controls. I'm going to go to time step zero, where there should be no smoke, and then animate forward in time. And you can tell this is not quite as fast as the barb renderer was, which was nearly instantaneous. Uh, the volume renderer is computationally expensive, again, because it is ray casting. So for some data sets, this is the kind of renderer where you will press play while capturing images and then step away from your computer and don't touch it until the rendering process is complete. So speaking of uh, capturing images, the way that you do that is under this capture menu up here at the top. So earlier we went to file to load our data. We went to tools for the Python derived variables. To capture imagery, you go to the capture menu and you can capture a single snapshot of the current uh, depiction, or you can capture an image sequence, which will take a snapshot of every modification that happens to Vapor, whether that's a change in the time step or a change in a parameter value. Every single modification will capture a new image. And so I'll do that. I'll select ping as my file format. Vapor will ask you to cite us. And then I will go to my captures directory. Let's see. I'm going to save these images as a demo. Vapor is asking for a prefix here. So all of my images will have demo prefixed by a uh, capture ID number, a four digit identifier for uh, what's being captured. So I'll click save. And if I play backwards in time, Vapor should now be capturing, if I go to that same directory, the demo files. So while that's going, I think this might be a good, well, actually it's not a good time to go to the Python API. Yeah, I can't stop Vapor either. So, Is it going to let me stop? Let me stop. Cool. So what I can do now is just open those files. And then I, I can use these images to create a um, an MPEG or an animation. The next thing I will do now is uh, get into the Python API. So. The first uh, Python API example I'll be doing is showing off our keyframing feature. Before that, I think since the volume renderer 
does have latency associated with it. I'm going to turn it off. Turn our barbs back on. Zoom out a little bit. And we're going to do a cinematic animation going from one point to the other and capture the images as we transition from point A to point B. So to specify point A, Vapor has a notion of a session file. And a session file is a save state. If uh, your computer crashes or a Vapor crashes, uh, Vapor will have a auto save session file that it automatically saves so you can come back to it in the event of a crash. But it also lets you save specific points in your workflow. So to save a session, I'll go to the file menu. I'll save a new session as, and let's see, I'll go to work fire. And I'm going to overwrite um, a previous session I had uh, that I called P1, perspective1.bs3, because we're going to be going from perspective1 and interpolate to perspective2. Save that, place it. And then my second perspective, I'll zoom out and maybe get a bird's eye view top down. That's good enough. The file, save session as, and I'll call this one P2. Okay, so now I'll minimize vapor and go over to the Python API, which is all controlled through, um, well, it's all installed through Anaconda. If you go to our website, you can find our instructions on how to install the Python API. It's a separate application, but it interoperates with the GUI. You just create a new Conda environment, activate it, and then you install it just with that command. And then once Conda is done installing it, you can uh, go to your terminal, and uh, if you have a Jupyter Notebook or, well, let's see, if you go to Python, if you just go into Python, you'll be able to module load vapor. Invalid syntax. Um, from vapor import everything. Okay, so that worked. Um, so Vapor has all these different modules and you can import them all this way. But one of the best ways to use Vapor for demonstration purposes, like right now, is to uh, show how it's used through a Jupyter Notebook. So I'm going to quit out. And in my current directory, I have a Jupyter Notebook that demonstrates some of the capabilities that are able to be used through the Python API. So Jupyter Notebook will launch my kernel and then give me a new browser. And from here, I can open up um, workfire.ipymb. And I'll go to my kernel, and I will restart the kernel and clear the outputs of all cells just to get a clean start. And then expand this. So the first thing we're going to do for keyframing, again, interpolating between two camera positions, is we're going to import this session module, which allows us to read in the sessions that we saved that contain the camera positions. And then we will load the camera module, which allows us to interrogate the session for these components of the camera that determine how it's described. And the camera is described by three triplets. Uh, there is your viewing direction, there is the up vector, and then there is the scalar position of the camera. And between those nine values, you uh, describe basically what you're looking at in the scene. So the first thing I'll do is I'll load the session module and the camera module. And the second thing I will do is load the session file that I just saved. That was p1.bs3. And after that gets loaded, I'm going to load those triplets. The or First, I'll load the camera from the session so that I can then inquire what the initial direction the camera is facing is, the initial position, and the initial up vector. I'll do the same thing for the second session, which was p2.bs3. Again, getting camera position two, direction two, uh, or camera two, direction two, position two, and the up vector. 
And then I'm going to just subtract the two values from each other. So we get the delta and the position on the x, y, and z axis. The delta on x, y, and z for the direction, and same goes for the up. And then this is just performing a linear interp interpolation over 50 steps. Um, let's overwrite it. <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but we'll see what happens. Um, while we interpolate over 50 steps, we're just gonna create a new position, apply that position to the camera, a new direction, apply that to the camera, a new up vector, apply it to the camera, and then finally render that scene over the course of 50 different steps. And while that's running, the kernel died. I wonder if this has to do with a lack of a fire smoke variable. Um, let's see, the kernel died. Do I have 927? Let's see, I have these, yeah, what happened? Well, it's, I'm running out of time. Instead of debugging this right now, I'll just show you guys what happened um, in a few minutes before I uh, started the tutorial. These are the captures that I was testing with uh, before it started. I had my two sessions with two different camera positions and you can see how the camera gets interpolated from position A to position B. Again, I'll have to troubleshoot why that kernel died. Um, usually there's a change to a session file that the notebook doesn't like, um, but I will uh, get to that you know, offline. Um, shoot, I am running out of time. I'm gonna go through this camera orbit really quick because it's there's a lot of linear algebra that I don't think is worth you know going through here. These two, I should say these two functions, the keyframing and the camera orbit are being built into the Vapor Python API. So in our next release, you should be able to just give Vapor's Python API two session files and a few other parameters and it'll automatically do the interpolation for you without having to do any of the math. Same goes for the camera orbit. But this just is a demonstration of kind of the power and the utility that can be achieved through the Python API, which we're trying to simplify and bring it to uh, the user base um, in, in a much more you know, easy to use way. And I have a feeling this uh, this fire smoke invalid reference is uh, making me nervous. So I don't think the kernel is gonna last, but I'm just gonna crank through these. And this is just showing that we can, it looks like it's rendering in this one. You can also save your uh, files as an MP4. Uh, through the Python API. So once that's done, I can click on rotation.mp4. Let's see what happens here. Pop-up window blocked. I have an ad blocker. Okay, let's go to, I think I must have saved it. Uh, there it is. Okay, so that one didn't crash the kernel and it uh, got through the pop-up blocker. So there you go. There's our basic rotation around a point of origin uh, rotating around the z-axis. The last thing I wanted to show real quick is our uh, particle renderer. So um, if I go back to Vapor. I'm gonna close out this session and start a new one. In the reference materials, I've added a link to the particle data uh, that I'll be showing here. This is a volcanic eruption uh, showing embers from, from an eruption. And I'm going to demonstrate that real quick. So if I go to File, Import, and in the same way that we did before when we imported our Domain 01 or Domain 02, we could then, uh, if you have Ember data, import data collection particles, and then go to your particle data, select all the files, Click on open. And here we are again at our baseline. Nothing to see because we made no renderers. I'll click on the plus icon and then I'll click on the particle renderer down here. And then I'll just turn it on by default and just show you guys what that looks like. Let's see, let's, do I wanna, yeah, let's just go see what happens.
actually seems to be moving too slow. It's barely moving. You can barely see it. But again, each one of these points is just described in a NetCDF file that has a particle value, uh, that has a um, position, a direction, and a velocity. And all this is documented on our website uh, for how to get your Ember data, however it might look, into a conformant NetCDF file that can be read by Vapor. I'm gonna pause it real quick and show you guys some of the other parameters. So these are the, the velocity fields, the variable name that's being colored. You can um, adjust the, the particle radius scalar. So if you have a variable that associates with the size of the particle, um, you can change the particle size. You can see they're uniform on, on this simulation. All the particles are the same size. Um, you can size them by speed if you wanted to, but there's probably more rational variables uh, that you might have in mind. In the appearance tab, let's uh, add some color to it because the transfer function was initialized at the first time step when there were really there was not a much as much of a spread in data values as there is right now. So now that we're halfway through the simulation, there's more of a spread, uh, more color to be shown. I'm going to shrink the radius down and play a few more frames. And then finally, if you're interested in particle direction, we can uh, render tubes that follow the path that the particle is following. So to do that, I can click on the show direction checkbox and <laughs> the volcano explodes. Um, we can reduce the length scale. So let's uh, bring this down to one maybe. I'd say bring the radius down a little more. And then I'd say bring the length scale down to 0.05. And let's see what that looks like. Length scales are still a little bit too long to really get an idea of what's going on here, but that's just part of Vapor, uh, playing with the parameters until you get the right visual aesthetic to show your observables. So I think that covers most of what I wanted to go through. Um, I can leave the floor open to any questions and I will be online uh, this evening, as well as on the first set of office hours on Friday. So you can uh, ask questions now or meet up with me at any other time or reach out to us on our website. You know, we're pretty responsive. If you just go to, um, you know, vapor.ucar.edu, we have a forum that you can post to, or you can email us directly at these email addresses down here. And then lastly, if you do want UX or any ideas or any kind of feedback, uh, check out this link. And uh, we're looking for more uh, UX feedback uh, in particular. So um, thanks for your time, guys. I hope this is helpful. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, very informative. Lots of great features of Vapor. Um, there is one question in the chat. Um, question is, can we add uh, SHP shape files in this? Yes, that is one of the renderers. Um, so if I go to Vapor and I instantiate the model renderer, you can do things like windmills and that kind of thing. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for Scott while we have them? Okay. Everything was crystal clear. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully folks all right, get the chance to uh, to work with Vapor. And Scott, maybe you want to just briefly say something about um, the examples on the website or like the bundled examples that are available there. And because I think there is one 
or there's a few for Wharf. Is that right? Yeah. So we're actually working on getting some more examples up online, but I think one of them is the East Troublesome fire that we saw on the PowerPoint slides. If I go to the download section, there is a sample data category. There's a Marshall fire. We don't have the East Troublesome fire up, but we do have a Marshall wildfire. Maybe East Troublesome was too big. Yeah, I think uh, it might have been too large. Yeah. But um, Marshall's a good one too, I'd say. Uh, a couple of other Wharf ARW samples as well. Great, thanks. Uh, last chance for questions for Scott right now. I will mention real quick, we have a YouTube channel that's full of tutorials. Um, that's, again, the best way that I think I learned these graphics applications is to watch somebody do it and uh, go to a timestamp that's pointed out in the, in the description. So um, I'd recommend checking that out. Okay, great. Thank you, Scott. I will stop the recording.